Hello and welcome to Codex. Our speaker today is Dan Edidin, who is a professor at the University of Missouri. Dr. Edidin is an expert in algebraic geometry and its application to harmonic analysis. Today, he will tell us about dihedral multi-reference alignment. Take it away, Dan. All right, well, thanks Thanks for the invitation. Uh, sorry, we can't all be in the same room, and, uh, but uh, this, I guess, the next best thing. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is, you can see the title, and I should mention this is this, uh, whoops, there we go. This is based on, on collaborative effort with Tamir Bendori, Will Lieb, and Nir Sharon, and you can find our paper on the archive um, from July. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is, uh, so I've sort of gotten in, um, Dustin was asking me, you know, how did I get into um, multi-reference alignment? Well, I, I got connected with some of the, the people doing cryo-EM, the mathematics of cryo-EM, that is. Um, and so this, this problem is physically motivated by cryo-electron microscopy. So I, I, you know, I feel like the talk's not complete unless I tell you a little bit about our physical motivation. So this is a, this is a, a big deal in molecular imaging. Uh, it came into wide use um, in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to, um, to these, uh, I guess it's uh, three guys, uh, um, uh, Dubochet, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson. Um, and actually, they, it's sort of a, you know, you know, if you read the history, it's kind of interesting. So I guess Dubochet was the first, had a physical technique, and then, um, and then the sort of improvement in, in resolutions um, over the years. I mean, so the technique of cryo-electron microscopy is about 40 years old, but it's probably only been maybe since, you know, the 2010s where they really had, um, where they were really just getting really, really high resolution. And, and so that's what the, the Nobel Committee um, cited them for. So, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a long history, um, but it's, it's a recent thing where they're really getting excited, exciting results. So, so essentially, yeah, so this is, um, this is the story. So in, in cryo-EM, biological molecules are suspended in a, in a liquid solution and rapidly, rapidly frozen to extremely low temperatures. And it's a, I looked this up, it's about 100 Kelvin. And this process is called vitrification. And that, that's actually what Dubochet did. So, the, and like I said, his first papers on this were about 1980. And the main thing is it prevents formations of ice crystals. And so this is, this is very good for biological molecules. You don't destroy them. Um, by doing this, and then you and then you zap it with a low intensity electron beam, and you measure sort of multiple projections of this. And I should say, I mean, that there's a there's an older technique which has been around for probably a hundred years, which which is X-ray crystallography, and it's still used. Uh, again, the the main advantage of this is is that you you're able to um, you don't have to do crystallization, and I, and I guess as I understand it, the setup is not as um, is difficult. Um, and so the, the now analyzing the data though is, is perhaps more difficult. So you, you get this and, uh, oops, let's see. And so, okay, so I, I preempted my, my next slide. Um, and so the main thing that's happened since 2013 is that there's just been big advances in hardware and data processing techniques. And so there's been a, a big explosion in, in high resolution molecular structures by determined by cryo-EM. And, um, and of course, every time a mathematician sees data processing techniques, they think there might be something, there might be something interesting there, right? For, for us mathematicians. And so now I, you know, you can't have talk. So this, this is um, sort of a, a picture of the setup. I know the, the font is, is kind of tiny, um, but essentially, well, there you go. I have a picture and the, the slides get posted somewhere so you can study the picture more. And this comes from the Nobel uh, prize webpage, in fact. Okay, so uh, mathematically, what is the, what is the cryo EM um, problem? So essentially, you have a function from R three to R, which is the energy density function of your desired molecule. And again, in practice, you're going to disc discretize this function, but just for the moment, we'll view this as a continuous function or an L, you know, say an L two function. And um, what are you doing? Well, you're, you're taking this thing and you're rotating it and then you're projecting it. And um, there was something about, um, there was something about uh, this, this low energy density electron beam uh, 
Uh, so what the low energy and uh, the effect of the low energy electron density beam uh, means that your, your noise factor is very high, right? So of course we expect noise in any kind of measurement, measurement thing. And ma as mathematicians, we, you know, we, we think about ways we can, we can um, sort of eliminate the noise um, mathematically. But so in this situation, so the, this, is, this is your setup. So you, you, you rotate, you project, and then you add a whole ton of noise. Okay, and so P is just some projection from R3 to R2, and um, RW is sort of an unknown rotation, and it's kind of random, and again, the noise level is high, and so the goal is, well, of course, you can't, in a situation like this, you can't recover the, the function um, directly, but you can recover it up, you, you essentially want to recover it up to the action of SO3, so you're trying to do, you're trying to recover an orbit, and as somebody who spent a lot of time I mean, Emily said I, I did algebraic geometry, but but within algebraic geometry, my main thing was sort of group actions in algebraic geometry. So when you see a group acting, you, you know, as as somebody like me, I you know you can't I can't resist, right? It's it becomes a problem, you know, questions in invariant theory. Okay, so um, so the multi-reference alignment problem is essentially an abstract an abstract of the cryo-EM problem. And uh, so precisely, you want to recover the orbit of an unknown signal in a vector space from some measurements of the form. So you have a group acting. Uh, so GI are unknown elements of some compact group like SO3. Um, P is a projection, is some sort of linear operator. It doesn't have to be a projection. Um, in practice, Essentially, most of the literature on MRA deals with P is equal to the identity, in fact. So, so the problem is, is so you sort of this P is a little bit optional. Um, and in fact, I, you know, it's a little unclear what some people might say it's not MRA unless you, unless you don't have the P. But I think, I think it's fair to sort of put it in, in one framework here. So this, this is, um, and some people, you know, anyway, so you, you can get an argument what exact definition of MRA, but it's my talk, so I'm going to tell you this is the definition of MRA. is, is includes the projection, and then I'm and then I'm going to ignore the projection, and then you have noise. Well, you have to you know if you want to do anything with the noise, you have to make some assumption. So we assume it's you know it's Gaussian noise with some standard deviation sigma. So whether you know that's so that's something we we can analyze a reasonable assumption. Um, and there's been a lot of literature on MRA. Um, interestingly, you know, people have written a ton of papers just on the very basic case of where, again, the projection is the identity. Um, and the group is, is a very modest group. It's, it's the cyclic group, it's ZN, and it's just acting on RN by, by shifts, right? So, it's so, so, you know, you shift by one, by two, et cetera. So a very simple, a very simple version of, it's like a one-dimensional version of what might be going on with the rotations. Um, which is why, you know, even going to the dihedral group, I mean, so this, this, you know, I guess the physicists like this term toy model, it's a bit of a toy model, but it's still mathematically already pretty interesting. And so, um, so that's, that's the sort of our, the starting block for, for the work in this, in this paper. And, and some of my co-authors are, are, um, are these anonymous researchers. So I originally had a slide where I, I and originally put this in where I had like, all the references to every paper I could dig up on this, but then I thought, you know, you guys are going to just see a bunch of numbers um, in brackets. So I, I thought that it wasn't much point, but um, if you go to the archive paper, you'll see all the references. Uh, so that's that's where things stood. And um, Pam, so, <clears throat> sorry. Pam, quick yeah. question. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we know about the standard deviation sigma? Do we know that or do we assume it? Can we estimate uh, it? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So the way we set it up, we pretend that we know it. Um, there are ways to estimate it as well. I mean, if you given the data, you you can do. Um, so what do you, what do you do? You can you can do some sort of averaging game over like if you given like. So you got noisy data and it's a vector, right? So then you you can. Um, there is a way, as I'm going to forget now, right? But it's there is a way to get try to guess based on the noisy data you've got and what that standard deviation is. Um, from the point of view of this talk, most of what I'm doing technically is algebra, so it doesn't enter into what I do. Um, but there's this concept of sample complexity, which I'll mention, and that's a function of the standard deviation. 
And so that's about how many measurements I need. And so there, yeah, we kind of treat it like you already knew the standard deviation, but in principle, you could, you could do some, some averaging to try to figure out what that standard deviation, but that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, um, so if you're given the setup, and again, like I said, even though I put the P in, I'm mostly not going to focus on the P. Um, so the, there's one method, which is, which is called synchronization. And it's very intuitive, which is why I want to mention it. It's not what I'm going to talk about, but um, it's not, it's not, we don't have new, you know, it's not where we're going to get the new results, but I do want to point out. So, so again, if, if you know the signal to noise ratio, um, so let's see, and I always, so this is low noise, right? So S signal to noise ratio is high in the low noise regime. I gotta I always gotta remember that. Um, so then you can try to guess the um, the orbit. So basically, you you have these unknown group elements, um, and to essentially, well, what is it? I mean, you're only trying to find an orbit. So I mean, you can more or less just say the first unknown group element is the identity, if you like, and then you're sort of essentially trying to find, as it were, the ratios of these unknown group elements. And the, the way to do that might be, okay, well, how does, you know, how do they relate? Well, you just solve this minimization problem so that you take, you know, yi minus gyj. And if I did everything correct, yes, I did it correctly. The, the solution, if there's in the absence of noise, uh, the minimization should occur at gija inverse, gij inverse, right? So you're solving for the g, which makes this smallest. This has some issues, obviously, for example, if the group is really big, you you have to sort of do a lot of these different things. Um, but, you know, it, it can be done. It's certainly been done. There's been an analysis of this for the cyclic group. Um, and then the orbit of the signal can be approximated by averaging over these synchronized. So you essentially try to get them all aligned properly, and then you average over the synchronized measurements. Um, however, uh, if the SNR is low, so that's high noise, uh, then these GIJs, essentially they're gonna be random because the noise is gonna be much, the noise is gonna affect the difference between these, like, I mean, basically this, this difference is gonna be dominated by noise. And there's a nice picture of this that I stole from, actually it's a, it's a previous paper that some of my co-authors are authors on and, and unfortunately I noticed this, just three minutes before showtime, so I didn't have a chance to fix the reference. Although again, you just see a number there. I think that's number one. Um, I do have a bibliography at the end of this. So I guess, Emily, before I send you the actual notes, I'll, I'll try to make sure to get that tech to work. Um, but, but here's, you know, so this picture, um, what, what happens is, so you have, here's a signal and that, whoops, and then you shift it. And then, so we're shifting it over to the left, right? So we start here, then we shift it, and then we shift it. Um, if we add a little bit of noise, we can sort of say, okay, yes, that's a noisy version of the original signal. That's a noisy version of the original shift, the first shift, noisy version of the second shift. But, you know, if, so we, we increase the noise, the standard deviation of the noise by 20, multiply it by 20, and we get, you know, three lovely pink squiggles, which, you know, if if somebody asked you to tell you it's like a police lineup, which one of these is the shift, right? You you don't really have any idea, um, except of course it's lined up with these other ones. So that's essentially why synchronization isn't going to work in the in the high noise regime. Um, okay, so uh, if in the high noise regime, uh, what you want to work on instead is is the method of moments. And again, this is something that that's a very active topic in, in cryo. Uh, sort of um, using using method of moments to try to again get a get a good um, estimate for the orbit of of your signal. So I give you a bunch of measurements, and um, so they're all of this form: gi applied to x plus my noise. I have n of them, so I just I make this tensor right. So I take yi tensor l. So it, you know, so in, in if l is one, that's just a vec. That's just um, essentially the average of the yi's over, over a sort of all these random sort of um, group translations. Uh, if n is, uh, if l is two, that's going to be some sort of matrix. And if, if l is three, I mean, there's no, you know, it's, it's an array, right? Which is why I just uh, put it as a, I wrote it as a 
as a tensor, right? So, um, and um, and then there's there's some probability theory, which you know is sort of you know it's it's not in my scope of expertise, but but there are you know there are theorems that sort of says that as n goes to infinity, um, the empirical moments are going to converge to the probabilistic moment. So the probabilistic moment is the expectation. Um, so the, these G's are, they're quote unquote random. So what that means is you have a distribution on the group, a probability distribution on the group, and you take the expectation of, you know, G applied to X. I suppose I should have had a little circle to be consistent in my notation. And then you took, you again, you take these, these tensors. And so that's, that's the probabilistic moment. And so the law of large numbers um, says that, you know, as if you take enough of these, uh, these uh, measurements, you, you, you're going to converge to the actual probabilistic moments. And um, of course, Dustin was asking about the standard deviation. So the standard deviation comes in to, you know, when, it, when does this start to become an accurate approximator to the actual probabilistic moments? Like how many do I need to take? And that's obviously determined, um, it has something to do with the noise factor, right? If, if the noise is zero, then, um, this, this, you don't need so many. And so, um, and in that case, it's essentially governed by the, the variance, right? So, it, so it sort of grows as the, as the, um, the variance, so the, num the number of measurements you need. And so that's, that's why we can talk about these terms like sample complexity and, and so on for, for method of moments. Um, so, uh, so, and here's, again, I, I have this tendency to, to preempt myself. So, an important theoretical problem is to determine the sample complexity of an MRA problem. I don't want to define the sample complexity here, but I'll just say it's a bound on the number of measurements as a function that you need for an accurate approximation. So I didn't, I didn't write that here, but um, for, you know, so that to give you a good approximation is a function of the noise level. And um, well, okay, for empirical moments to approximate the probabilistic moments, the number of samples has to grow on the order of the variance, so sigma squared. And so um, if you want to approximate the lth moment, you're going to take a tensor, right? So the number of entries in a tensor um, is L squared. Now it's actually a symmetric tensor, so you can you can more or less divide that by two, uh, but you're still you still basically going to take sigma squared to the to the um, to the L. So your 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 amount of you know computing firepower you're going to need is on the order of sigma to the 2L to, to compute um, the Lth moment. And so if you're, if you're in a happy situation, um, uh, if, so if you can recover from the first L moments, well, that's, that's then your sample complexity will be sigma to the 2L. Um, you know, if L is 10,000, you're not really that happy. Uh, but you know, ideally, and in the problems we we find, um, both in in um, so in in the um, so in the case of the cyclic group, and um, and then in the case of the dihedral group, we'll see that we can we can do it in in certain cases in, in small, being two or three, and in cryo there are results like this too under under certain assumptions. Um, again, the, the problem got discretized when it when it when it went to cryo, so it's. You know, some some assumptions were were made on the distribution and and the the signal itself. Um, you know, with sort of a band limiting assumption, if you like. Um, so um, so first of all, uh, so I have no idea what time it is because uh, okay, so it's twelve twenty two. All right, I just got home. My phone is went dark. So so in the MRA problem. The elements of the group G are, I said, they're randomly. So, what does it mean to be random? Well, uh, the most reasonable guess you're going to make is each element of the group occurs equally likely. So, in a finite group, you completely understand what that means. Uh, in the in a continuous group like SO3, you could say you have a Haar measure, right? So, so, but you imagine some sort of uniform distribution. I mean, no no group element should occur more, more likely than not. Um, and in that case, so there's good news, although in some sense there's also bad news. So in that case, so first of all, I never claimed that my moments 
could recover the signal, right? I said, if the Lth moment, you know, if, if I can compute the first L moments and that's enough to recover an orbit, then, you know, I know sample complexity is whatever it is, right? Sigma to the 2L. Um, but in the case when the, when the distribution is uniform, then essentially these, these moments are just invariant polynomial functions of degree L. And in fact, they're, they form a basis for the set of invariant polynomials of degree L. And there's a wonderful theorem of Hilbert, so more than 100 years old, that tells us that there exists an L such that the orbit of all X and V can be recovered from, from the first L moment. So this, this is a, a very fancy way of, or maybe a not so fancy way of saying that the ring of invariance of the action of a compact group is always finitely generated. Right. And so this, this is something that Hilbert proved a long time ago. And, you know, he proved it by magic, right? He, did, he didn't actually have any estimate on the number of the number, the degrees. He just proved the it finally generate, um, generation. Uh, but at least you would know that it could work. Now, if, if the distribution is not uniform, actually, I don't know a theoretical guarantee off top. I mean, it's possible there is one, but off the top of my head, I don't know one. Um, and I suppose, for example, if the distribution is, is um, you know, it's, it's like a delta function. It might not even be true, right? I mean, if, if you know, the probability of one group en entry is one, I mean, you could do all kinds of silly things, right? And probably buy like this. Um, so the problem is in computing, in general computing degrees of invariance you need to generate the invariant ring. So K is my, my, my field, right? It, it could be typically R or C occasionally. Uh, it's a, that's a hard problem. I mean, that's, that's a hard computational algebra problem. Um, and uh, so on the other hand, there's, there's a very nice theorem, uh, which is, is not due, due to us, but it's, it's in a paper of, of, uh, with a lot of authors. And actually the first time I, I wrote this slide, I, I left out poor, poor Joe Khalil. So it's Bandera, Bloomsmith, Khalil, Perry, Weed, and Wine um, have this result. And, and that's a, it's like I said, it's a, it's a beautiful result. Um, it's about decomposing a, a three tensor, basically. It's a statement about decomposing a three tensor. Um, but the, um, what I want to draw out of it is simply this fact. So V contains a copy of the regular representation of G, then a generic, a generic signal. So now I don't claim all signals, but from the point of view of, of sort of typical signal processing, you know, we, we typically figure generics okay, right? Because you, you know, with probability one, your signal is going to be fine, right? So, so um, then you can recover from the first three moments. So it, it's um, and so what's the regular representation? So the regular representation is um, uh, it's a set of functions from the group to to the field, but the group is finite. So this is just you know it's just the number of elements in G copies of the field, and um, it, is, it plays in a very important role in representation theory of finite groups. Um, it's the sum of the, so a finite group has a finite number of irreducible representations and um, it's the sum of the, the irreducibles with multiplicity equal to their dimensions, right? So it's a, it's a very special representation. Um, I will tell you that the cyclic group, when, when the cyclic group acts on Rn by shifts, that's the regular representation. So that, that's an n-dimensional representation of, of the, an element group, and that is the regular representation. So, um, so a corollary of this uh, for MRA for um, for ZN uh, was is that if, if ZN acts by cyclic shifts and the probability of distribution on ZN is uniform, then an orbit can be recovered from the first three moments. So the sample complexity and and that's that's a that's um, essentially a necessary and sufficient condition actually, right? So it, it is necessary. You can't recover generic orbits from two moments um, in this case. And again, that's a statement in invariant theory. So uh, the corollary uh, has a common set of authors, but it's not, the reason I didn't, I mean, this does follow from this theorem, but it was actually proved in an earlier paper, like a, a paper that was like six months earlier by Bandera, Rigolet, and Weed, and then I guess, they got together and proved a more general result from which it's also a corollary. But the original result for um, MRA was actually in this earlier paper. And again, I, I've got the bibliography at the end, so we can, you know, if you, if you want to download the slides, you will, you'll see the bibliography. Um, 
Okay, so that's that's the um, that's MRA for the cyclic group because it's a regular representation. You you get you know three moments are okay, but two moments are not. It's also known. Um, so on the other hand, not you could ask what if the distribution is not a uniform distribution? And first of all, it's a mathematically interesting question. Uh, second of all, it's um, it's sort of a physically relevant situation because in cry say in cryo em which is somehow the you know it's 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 the it's the one it's the problem that rules them all right so it's it's the one that that everybody's after here it is not the case that the i mean those rotations aren't uniformly distributed um i don't know enough of the you know the physics to tell you what uh you know in what way they're not uniformly distributed um so uh so let's just think about what it means to have a distribution. And again, we'll focus on the finite group, which is this, this is very easy to, to kind of get your hands on. So in a, in a finite group, and, it, and it's very amenable to, to sort of language of algebraic geometry. So in a finite group, um, a probability distribution is simply a, it's a function, right? It's a function, you know, you give an element of the group, you're gonna give it a number that's, it's not gonna be a negative number. And they're going to add up to one, right? That's that's all probability distribution is, and um, and so it follows actually that um, the set of probability distributions is a so you're looking at functions on the group, and as I said, that's the, that's the regular representation of the of the group, right? So it's it's this very special representation. Um, you don't allow any any functions, right? Because you you have to, you have to basically, they have to live in that simplex in the regular representation, right? They have to have, their sums have to be one for them to be a probability distribution. Um, but it's, uh, it's that, that set of, of um, so that's an affine linear subspace, right? It's just a, it's like a hyperplane. So it doesn't go through the origin. Um, that's Zariski dense. And so what does Zariski dense mean? Well, it means that like there, there's no, um, it's not contained in any, the set of probability distributions is not contained in any proper sub variety of this, of this affine hypersurface, which lives in the regular, regular representation. Um, so, uh, so now if I view the, if I view the, um, if I, if I view the, um, the probabilistic moment, so I, I'm just expanding out what it means to, to take the expectation. Again, we're in the finite group case. So it's the probability of G, and then you take the L tensor, you know, you take the L tensor of GX and you sum over all elements of, of the group. And so what I can view this is, this is itself an invariant function. It's a function of, of its degree one in, in the group part. And, uh, in, and it's degree L in the, in the sort of, um, in the x part, right? So it's it's a function of um, of by degree one l on the regular representation cross cross v, um, and so again uh, we know, for example, that uh, functions of degree three on that representation, moments of degree three, um, will will give us enough to recover orbits. Now, unfortunately, we we don't get all moments of degree three, we get the ones of, de of degree one L. So I'm in an unfortunate situation. You're all, you know, the Zoom stuff pops up on my screen. I can't even read the bottom of my own slides. Okay, there we go. Um, so that's that's the way I want to view the moments as a um, as a collection of G invariant functions, not on the on the representation, but on the regular representation cross across the original representation. And so now I can, um, I can talk about how, how many moments are needed to recover a generic vector. So I can, I can essentially, you know, again, so I have one trick, right? So if, if you've read my papers, essentially I, I have one trick and that's, that's like, I have this joker that says generic, right? And every time I get into a bind, I just, I just pull it out of my, uh, pull it out of my sleeve and I say, okay, I can do this because I just assume things are, are generic. So I'm gonna ask the question, we can ask about how many moments are needed to recover a generic vector. 
with a generic probability distribution. So again, it, it makes sense to talk about generic probability distribution. So in other words, the probability distributions that don't satisfy the conclusion of whatever theorem I'm claiming are, are lie in some proper subvariety. And so there's already a result which, which was, doesn't use so much of the algebraic geometry terminology. Uh, so, and again, this, this is sort of, this was the launching point. So I read this paper and you can see that um, three of the, my three co-authors are authors of this paper, right? So uh, along with Abe and, and Singer and, and also Pereira. So they proved, um, and it's a, it's a really beautiful paper, which uh, for generic probability distribution on the cyclic group, a generic orbit can be recovered from the first two moments. Uh, in particular, the sample complexity for MRA with generic distribution is, is, is actually smaller. You do better. You only need to take on the order of um, the variance squared, so, so the, or the deviation to the fourth number of measurements. And they actually, they're able to, um, give a, a pretty precise condition on the distribution and the signal. So the distribution is, is essentially what they call aperiodic, right? So there's no periods, right, in the, you know, so you have a probability of, of you know, that you shift by one, a probability you shift by two and, and three and so on. And, um, you know, th there's, no, there's no regularity to that, right? There's no, and of course the uniform distribution is about as, un, is about as periodic as you can be, right? Because it's a period one, right? All, all values are the same. And they also make this assumption that the discrete Fourier transform of, um, so I didn't say the DF, what the DFT, the DFT of what? So of, of the signal that you're trying to recover, uh, that has no zero entries. So that, that's some assumption. And actually we make the same assumption as, as well about the no zero entries. And um, uh, so in addition, they, uh, they have a, a really nice, it's essentially a spectral algorithm, right? So they, they, can, they can recover the orbit as an eigenvector of some, of some matrix. Um, the reason they can, they can get this situation in such a nice way um, is basically because the cyclic group, it's, it's a, what's called a diagonalizable group, right? So it, it means that, um, so the cyclic group acting on Rn, um, it's shifting, but everybody knows when you do a shift, and if you apply the Fourier transform, you just multiply by, and so this is discrete Fourier transform, you just multiply by a root of unity, right? So you just, you get a phase shift, right? So um, in the Fourier domain, the action is, is diagonalized. And what that basically buys you is that the, it means that the entrance of your, entries of your moment tensor, you're, you know, you're, you're gonna, so each, um, so you take, you know, you take X, tensored with itself L time. So you get this giant, you know, tensor, which is a bunch of, you know, it's a bunch of monomials. And, but then you're adding them over all group translates of that. But if you do this in the Fourier domain, you're just adding over, you know, you, you have what, you know, whatever, you have X, I, X, J, and then you apply the group, you're gonna just multiply that by some root of unity, right? So when you add them all up, all you've done is you've just rescaled that, you just still get a monomial. And so the entries of the moment tensors are monomial. So that's, that makes it just life a lot nicer than um, it would be in the, um, uh, you know, if you had an arbitrary group. So if you tried this with a symmetric group, it, it's not gonna work very well. Um, so, that, but on the other hand, you get this beautiful sort of, not only you get a theorem, you get a, you get a sort of a way to actually recover the orbit using, using a spectral algorithm. Um, so the dihedral group really is, you know, again, it's, it's the natural next step to consider. So it's a non-abelian group. It's, it's the um, group of, of um, symmetries of the regular n-gon. So it, you've got a rotation of order n and a reflection of order two and rotation and reflection aren't commuting, right? So if, if I uh, first rotate and then reflect, that's the same as doing the opposite rotation, right? So R to the N minus one is R inverse. And then I, and then I, um, and then, well, I guess, sorry, this is rotate then reflect, or you could reflect and then do the opposite rotation. So it's not an abelian group, but it's, at least it's not so far from an abelian group. And it has a natural action on, um, Rn, so where, and again, this is, you see this, this action is, isn't just some 
funny action, right? This, this, is, the, this is the invariance of the power spectrum in, in sort of actual, you know, in, in actual phase retrieval for the Fourier, for the, um, Fourier transform. So if I, if I, the rotation shifts and the reflection, um, well, it reflects basically. <laughs> And um, so again, that's, I just got that. So naturally occurs is a symmetry group in many physical problems. And, and again, one of my favorite problems is X-ray crystallography and where you see the power spectrum and that's a, that's a function which is invariant under these shifts and, and reflections. Um, and the problem we have now, right? The extra mathematical challenge is the action of the dihedral group cannot be diagonalized because it's not an abelian group. And so the, when you expand out the moment tensor, it's not gonna be monomials anymore. Um, the good news is it's not gonna be so terrible. And we'll see that in the, as we go through the, the proof. Um, so here's the theorem we proved. And uh, so consider the dihedral MRA problem uh, with a generic probability distribution. And then the, it turns out then in that case, the first and second order moments of Y. So Y is that measured data, you know, shift, you translate plus, plus noise are, sure, are sufficient to recover almost all orbits. And then of course, the, there's a corresponding sample complexity statement. I'm not sure I wrote it down, I don't remember. Um, but actually, interestingly, um, so based on what happened with the cyclic group, uh, you, you sort of have this idea that fewer moments are required if you allow some generic condition on the probability distribution. But I, I don't know that there's any kind of general theorem that says that. Um, so uh, for example, if the distribution is uniform, are three moments enough um, in the dihedral case to recover almost all orbits? And you can't use this, this result that I was mentioning by this long list of authors whose name I, I whose names I haven't memorized, but it was on that earlier slide. Um, so Bandera and, and a whole lot of other people, uh, because this RN is not the regular representation of the dihedral group. So the dihedral group is a two has two n elements. So its regular representation has two n elements, and so this is, has dimension two n, and this has only dimension n. So it's too small to be the regular representation. And on the other hand, that, that very general theorem that I quoted, um, the containing a copy of the regular representation was a sufficient condition, but it, it, there's no reason that it has to be a necessary condition. And again, it has to do with decomposing three tensors. And it, it's like, like I said, it's a very nice story, but, but uh, I wanna talk about what we did and not what's in that paper. Um, so um, so I, I just don't know. Uh, but let me, so let me talk about what I know. Again, this, this generic situation. And again, essentially, so I'm, I'm viewing the probability distribution as kind of a variable when I do that. And again, it's helpful to work in the Fourier domain. So let's see, so I have about 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah, so I, it gives me about a right amount of time to, um, uh, to sketch the proof. Um, so, um, so one is the paper of, of um, Abe at all that where they did and and my my collaborators where where they did the cyclic group with generic distribution. So what we'll do is we'll work with sort of the the moments in the Fourier domain. So we'll take the expectation of the Fourier the discrete Fourier transform of um, of of our data and um, so that which is also the Fourier transform of the first moment and then you do the same thing. Um, and you conjugate to the matrix. I, I never really, we never had to go past two, but obviously you could do this for higher moments. Um, I'd have to think a little bit about what the right formulas are. Uh, but anyway, uh, it doesn't matter because I didn't have to go past two. Um, and our theorem is, is actually a um, little more precise. For a generic distribution row, a generic orbit can be recovered. And we have a nice information theoretic bound so you just need the first entry of the Fourier moment, the first Fourier moment, the zeroth entry, and about two, 2.5 times the, ve the vector size entries of this, of this second matrix, the M hat two matrix, uh, which is again, the second moment just expressed in the Fourier domain. And I should point out that um, M one hat zero, all that is is the mean of the entries of the, of the vector X, right? Because 
the first entry of the Fourier transform is the sum of the entries in a vector, right? So, so, and then you divide by the dimension of the of the space. So m1 hat x of zero is, is simply the mean of the entries of x. Um, and um, so, okay, so let's see how this is gonna work. So we, we do, Define these things, these these functions, and okay. So this, I, I think this was supposed to be a hat, but it didn't. A, X is so I have row and X, and this became bold, but it was I think it was supposed to be a hat. Um, so essentially, this is some expression of what the moments look like in the Fourier dimension domain. So although they're not monomials, they're they're binomials. So they're not they're not so bad, right? And so they have degree one, one in the row in these in these P's and. Uh, and two in the Qs, right? And so, uh, oh yeah, I didn't, did I not tell you? Uh, yeah, okay, I never told you what the Ps and Qs are. So the Ps, um, this is where I'd love to be able to annotate, but I guess we don't know how to turn annotation on, right? So um, so the, the Ps you get by taking, you have a probability distribution, it's simply a vector, you can view it as a vector at length n vectors, you take its Fourier transform, you get, you get numbers, I mean, they're complex numbers, and you just read off the entries of that, of that vector. So that's what the p hats are. So you take your probability distribution. Oh, sorry, take it back. Your your group has two n elements, but you break it up as like one the identity rotation rotation squared up to the n minus one. That's the vector I call p. Then I take its Fourier transform, and then I have reflection reflection times rotation reflection times rotation squared, etc. That's another vector of length n, and that has. Um, another n entries and I take the Fourier transform of that. And then this, these x's, maybe they should have had hats on there on them. They're the entries in the Fourier transform of the vector of the vector um, x. So the, in this Fourier domain, essentially, um, although, although the entries of the moment tensor are not monomials, they're not so terrible, right? They're, they're binomials. And this mij is is well, it's you've got this factor of the dimension, but otherwise it's it's essentially this m hat two. It's it's actually it's the i n minus j entry, right? So it's like the i minus j entry. And the goal is to show that if I know right this this mean and you know some o of n, which is about two point five times the n times these um, of these mijs, I can I can determine the orbit. So what what's the what's the um, what's the trick? Um, well, first of all, you you have a probability distribution. So p hat zero plus q hat zero is just the sum of all these numbers. So it's it's just one. And so what that means is if you if you take i minus i, so that's you know like the i n minus i entry in that matrix. Uh, it's and again that should have a hat on there, so it's the absolute value of the Fourier transform. You know, it's the entry-wise absolute value of the Fourier transform of X is the power spectrum. So just from that one, um, so knowing, yeah, I just I already know the power spectrum of X. I mean, already know it's not, it's not that much information. And so then there's a trick, and again, this was this was in the original paper of um, Abe et al. You you just replace. Uh, x by a new vector so that you you can make its Fourier transform have all its entries um, have magnitude one and um, and you can take x zero to be one and then your your formula is sort of that you know what what you know is this is this quantity right it, or what what sorry what you not necessarily what you know but yeah no that is what you know right so it's it's this polynomial expression you don't know rho and, and x uh, but you know this this expression in, involving this um, you know this um, polynomial that you know, or it's a rational function at this point. And so to show that the orbit of x is determined by by this data, it's essentially you know now we get to where I like to have fun. I like to solve equations, right? I became an algebraic geometer because I just like to solve equations, right? Polynomial equations. And so. Um, so essentially, right, you're, you're trying to show that the certain system of equations, uh, you know that all these equations are invariant under the action of the dihedral group. So you just have to show that the no total number of solutions to this system of equations is the most, is at most equal to the number, the most, the size of the dihedral group. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm using this little stylus, it's not working very well. Okay, so this, so 
that's a system of equations. So for each i and j, I have an equation like that. Um, so mijs are what I measured, right? That's the, the moment of the unknown signal, which I, I assume that I know in this algebra problem. And I'm trying to show that this system of equations has at most two n solutions. And, um, and so again, you know, uh, rho prime is, is, rho, is another probability distribution. Z is another vector. I can take its Fourier transform, et cetera. Okay, so, um, so that's what I'm trying to do. And it turns out I don't need, you know, so there's a quadratic in, you know, there's on order of n squared number of these equations, but I don't need that many of them, um, at least for generic reconstruction. So what I'll do is um, fix a number L, okay? And uh, look at the look at these particular entries. This, so this is this is there's a order of n number of entries of this form where where the index sums to to one basically, right? L one minus L. And so in the in the sort of P and Q part, these are linear equations. In in P, you know, in this case, in P you know, whatever that thing is, we'll just call it P of one, you know, it actually says P prime hat of one, but, uh, and Q of N minus one. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a linear equation. And I've got a bunch of these, I've got a whole bunch of these linear equations for the same expressions, right? So they're, they're linear equations in these unknown, in these unknowns. So they'll have solutions expressed in terms of whatever these Z's are, right? So it doesn't solve the problem, but it tells you actually a huge amount of information because it's a bunch of linear equations. They have to be consistent, right? So there's only there is a solution to this because we know that x and rho is a solution. So I, I have this very I have this um, giant two by whatever two by n size linear system, and it better be consistent, which means a whole lot of like two by two minors of things have to have to equal to each other, right? And when you when you sort of put that together and, you, and you're a little bit clever, you can choose different values of L. And what you end up is you can end up the consistency of that system forces you, you can get this sort of n's plus first guy as a rational function of actually of, it turns out of just the first two and the two behind it. Like so so z1 hat, z2 hat, z z n minus one and z n. So so now you can you can you sort of got you've driven a wedge into this problem, and so now you can sort of keep going. And essentially, what you end up in the situation is that you can show that all of your all of your z hat ends are basically going to be governed by z one and z two. And now you feel like you know victory is is yours for the taking. Um, uh, you show that for each value of z one, there's only two possible values of z two. That gives you the two. And then finally, you show that Z1 has a polynomial of degree N, and you, you, you know, you're, you're victorious, right? So you've, you've solved this. And again, the key insight is, is to just view this as this, as this giant, way overdetermined linear system, which you know has a solution, and use the fact that you know it has a solution to imply that it's consistent to get information about sort of relations among the unknown entries Z. And I mean, I guess I can solve for the P's, but I never really need to because um, I only care about the I only care about the Z's. So I guess sometimes people call the P's and the Q's um, they call them uh, nuisance parameters, right? You, you don't need to know them, but they're floating around. So um, and you don't find them. So that's that's um, that's the end of my talk. And there's my bibliography, which I'm sure nobody can read. But but again, that's that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven are are indexed to that. And when I when I send Emily the notes, I'll I'll have that there. All right. So there we go. All right. Let's thank Dan for that great talk.